John Robert Osborne is not a name well known in his home county of Norfolk, or even really across the UK, but I think he should be. His selfless sacrifice during the heat of battle saved several lives, and by the end of this video, I hope you agree as well. Born in the village of Folden, West Norfolk, on the 2nd of January 1899, he grew up in less than illustrious surroundings. He was the third son of his father, who was a travelling horse dealer, and his wife, Harriet Susanna. He spent his childhood travelling from horse fair to horse fair, looking for work in a gypsy-style caravan, as well as selling pegs and doing other seasonal work to make ends meet. With a childhood spent in this way, it is no shock that John's education suffered, and he was very rarely in class at Folden Village School. As he grew older, he would go on to work in a travelling circus and as a stable groom, until, like it did for millions of young men of his generation, two gun shots fired in Central Europe would change his life forever. He would watch his older brothers go off to war, but John currently was too young and would not join up for the First World War until late 1916. John's first stint in uniform is a rather confusing one, with reports from after his death claiming he saw accident at Jutland. Only, this battle took place several months before he even enlisted, as well as him seeing action in France and Russia with the Royal Naval Division. Others claimed he was wounded at the Battle of Cambrai on the 2nd of March 1917. But this was most likely another John Osborne, as he would probably have still been in training at the time. Of course, like so many others of his generation, John talked little about his experience in the war, and even his own sons were unable to shed much light on what happened. He said he was taken prisoner and wounded, but escaped after two days and rejoined his unit. He had bullet wounds and shrapnel, scars on his right forearm and right leg. He was evacuated and on release from hospital, sent as a reinforcement to the Western Front, where he became the casualty of a mustard gas attack. However, from what records exist, the truth appears much more prosaic. There is no evidence to suggest he was ever in Russia or at Jutland. What can be determined is he was a member of the Royal Naval Division, division that was originally formed from Royal Navy and Royal Marine Volunteers in 1914, who were not needed for service at sea. They had served in the Siege of Antwerp and the Gallipoli Campaign, but after losses, they were handed over to Army Command in 1916, where they were officially redesignated the 63rd Royal Naval Division by the time John had joined their ranks. He would join the Hawke Battalion in February 1918 near Flickclare. It is unclear if the stories of him being captured and escaping are true, or if he got in the way of any shrapnel during his stay in the trenches, but his time at the front would be a short one. It was about a month after arrival, he, along with 500 other men, were hospitalised due to a gas attack. Fred was evacuated back to England and would play no further part in the Great War. He was demobbed on the 15th of May 1919 and paid the sum of £11.10 shillings to aid him in civilian life. John had a lucky escape from the Western Front, but his family would not entirely be lucky. One of his older brothers was reported killed in the fighting of the First World War. The war may have been over, but John's problems were not. The effects of the gas plagued him terribly. He had eyesight problems and trouble breathing that would stay with him until his dying day. It would be during a visit to a doctor about his health problems that the idea of emigrating to Canada was brought up. The wide open spaces and clean air were seen perfect for a man with his kind of ailments. John agreed and sailed for Canada in 1920, aged 21. He would spend the first few years in his new home in a series of hard labouring jobs, from being a handyman to working at railway yards in Toronto and Manitoba, even having a stint working as a farmhand. During this time, he would meet and fall in love with Margaret Elizabeth Nelson, who he would marry and have a family with. His time at farming would come to a tragic end after an accident, which would force him to spend the next couple of years working in just dead-end jobs trying to support his family. It really was the love he had for his family that kept him going. His wife would often tell how John would even take extra jobs scrubbing floors just to make a little bit more money to support them with. It was his need for extra funds for his wife and children that would lead him, despite his health problems, to re-enlist in the military in 1933, joining as a militia man in the Canadian militia, the equivalent of the modern-day territorial army or reserves. Despite his list of injuries and illnesses picked up in the trenches or during his working life, John flourished in the Winnipeg Grenadiers. He was a tough man who never let his ailments slow him down. He was a stickler for discipline and with his past experience soon became a model soldier, being promoted to company sergeant major in only a year. On the 10th of September 1939, Canada would officially enter the Second World War, declaring war on Germany and her allies and the country began to mobilise their forces. 4,500 regulars and 51,000 reservists, John among them, waited for word of where they were going to be sent. The 1st Canadian Infantry Division would sail out for Britain in December 1939, and after the fall of France in the spring of 1940, would be the only fully equipped infantry division in the country until the arrival of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division that summer. John's first posting was to the Caribbean for a time, before the British and Canadian government decided they were more desperately needed elsewhere. Rather than going to Europe, or the deserts of North Africa, where the land war was now being fought exclusively since Britain and her allies had been driven from Greece. Instead, the Far East awaited him and the rest of the Winnipeg Grenadiers in the British colony 
of Hong Kong. Britain had had a sizable force in Hong Kong before the war, but the need for troops in Europe and the defence of the home islands had caused them to pull out all but a token force. Now, just over a year later, with most of their experienced troops engaged elsewhere, the eyes of Imperial Japan turned not only to the British, but all Western possessions across the Far East. Forces were quickly thrown together, a mix of nations and a mix of regular and reserved troops to fill the gaps. When John and the rest of the Winnipegs arrived in Hong Kong, the outlook must have been bleak. The troops were a mixed bag of experience and abilities. The Winnipeg Grenadiers themselves had been given 400 new recruits, a quarter of whom had yet to even finish basic training. Hong Kong itself had little in the way of real defences, other than the gin drinkers line, a line of fortifications heavily based on the already defeated Maginot line. And even then, there weren't enough men to man it properly. It soon became clear that they were little more than a token of resistance, who would not last very long if the Japanese came. The 1st Battalion of the Winnipeg Grenadiers were formed up with other Canadian units, most notably the Royal Canadian Rifles, into what was called Sea Force. They'd only been in Hong Kong for 22 days when the Japanese launched their massive assault across the Pacific. The date was December the 7th or 8th, 1941, most famously known as the date that will live in infamy for the attack on the US base in Pearl Harbor. But this day also saw the Japanese attack Wake Island, Midway Island, Guam, the Philippines, the Malay Peninsula heading for Singapore, Britain's prized possession in the Far East, and of course, Hong Kong, where a scraped together international force of Canadian, British, Indian, Free French, Chinese, and local Hong Kongers, numbering around 14,500, faced off against an invading army of 30,000 Japanese. The defenders of Hong Kong did get a little warning from Chinese refugees entering the territory on the 6th, telling of the build-up of Japanese troops, but they were still not ready for what came. Two days later, the attack began, starting with an air raid that killed two Royal Canadian signalers. Sea Force was initially stationed on the south side of the island in case of amphibious invasion, but the Japanese came from the north. Sea Force soon found themselves being sent into the counter-attack. John Osborne and the rest of A Company, 1st Battalion, the Winnipeg Grenadiers, were placed in reserve. Commanders had hoped the gin drinkers line would hold for at least a week, but for a number of reasons, the Japanese overran and captured it all in less than three days. On the 11th of December, the Winnipeg Grenadiers were going to combat. They were the first Canadian army unit to do so in the whole war, with D Company covering the retreat from Kowloon. In the chaos and confusion of these days, the Winnipegs would find themselves defending the crossroads at the Wong Ne Chong Gap, with A Company tasked on securing Mount Butler that dominated the nearby area at 1,421 feet tall. But the order didn't reach them in time, and the Japanese had occupied the summit. A desperate uphill battle began, an attack under heavy fire up a steep slope covered in trees and bushes in dawn light. It's no shock that only 80 men made it to the top in force, led by Lieutenant McKillop, but even he would lose his way before reaching the summit. The attack was in danger of petering out when Sergeant Major Osborne took charge, leading the final rush, taking the hill, bayonets fixed, sending Japanese troops on top fleeing for their lives. They had successfully taken the hill, but now they would have to hold it. John Osborne and his around 80 men would fight off wave after wave of Japanese attacks from up to three whole companies. The fighting at times was even hand to hand, with rifle butts, bayonets, knives, boots and fists. Osborne's 80 soon numbered much closer to 30, but still, they would hold their position for three hours before getting orders to pull back as they were in danger of being cut off. During the withdrawal from Mount Butler, more men fell, and John would put himself in danger time and time again, not only guarding his little band back, but finding men lost in the first attack and sending them to safety. Despite the bravery of Osborne and his men, the Japanese were soon closing in on them and their ammunition was almost gone. Osborne and around 12 men became hemmed in in a fold in the ground. Among them was Lance Corporal William Bell, who later told of their little battle. The Japanese were all around us. The enemy fire was terrific and our ammunition was running low. We received a barrage of rounds from the enemy mortars, grenades, small arms and machine gun fire from all angles. Even with the odds against them, they would repulse a further two attacks before the Japanese changed tactics and began to throw grenade after grenade into the Canadian position. John Osborne picked up and threw back at least two of these at the attackers. He was in the process of working out how to get his men out of this situation when a further grenade landed among them. There was no time to throw it back. John pulled a nearby sergeant out of the way and threw himself on it. The blast killed him instantly and wounded Lance Corporal Bell. But without his sacrifice, many more would have been killed or wounded. Hong Kong fell on the 25th of December 1941, with 10,000 men, including the survivors of Osborne's company, surrendering to the Japanese. The role of Sea Force would become controversial in the following years, with it both being praised for their bravery 
and blamed for the city's fall, but there can be little doubt that they fought hard. Major Reynolds Condon of the U.S. Army, who was a member of the U.S. attaché in Hong Kong, said of the men of Sea Force, Their individual courage, shown by officers and men, was amazing in the view of their low morale. The officers especially went towards their death without hesitation, although had in their hearts no hope of success. It was also pointed out that them, a half-trained force of 6,000, had held the Japanese back for 17 days, while in Singapore, a much larger force of 75,000 had surrendered in just eight. Even the commander of Sea Force, John K. Lawson, had fought to the end, sending a last radio message saying he was going outside to fight it out, 10 a.m. on the 19th. Around the same time, Osborne was given the orders to pull back. He was last seen alive, leaving his command post, with a pistol in each hand. The Japanese gave him a full burial with honours due to his bravery. There would be no burial for John Osborne. His body was never officially found, most likely cremated by the victorious Japanese like so many of the other fallen were, and his heroic deeds would remain unknown until the end of the war and the liberation of the men who had fought beside him. He would posthumously be awarded the Victoria Cross, the highest award available to members of the British Armed Forces and Empire troops at the time, on the 2nd of April 1946. The citation in the London Gazette the paper where all VCs are announced read, At Hong Kong, on the morning of the 19th of December 1941, a company of the Winnipeg Grenadiers, to which Company Sergeant Major Osborne belonged, became divided during an attack on Mount Butler, a hill rising steeply above sea level. A part of the company, led by Company Sergeant Major Osborne, captured the hill at the point of the bayonet and held it for three hours, when, owing to the superior numbers of the enemy and fire from an unprotected flank, the position became untenable. Company Sergeant Major Osborne and a small group covered the withdrawal, and when their turn came to fall back, Osborne single-handedly engaged the enemy while the remainder successfully rejoined the company. Company Sergeant Major Osborne had to run the gauntlet of heavy rifle and machine gun fire. With no consideration for his own safety, he assisted and directed stragglers to the new company position, exposing himself to heavy enemy fire to cover their retirement. Whenever danger threatened, he was there to encourage his men. During the afternoon, the company was cut off from the battalion and completely surrounded by the enemy, who were able to approach within grenade throwing distance to the slight depression which the company was holding. Several enemy grenades were thrown, which Company Sergeant Major Osborne picked up and threw back. The enemy threw a grenade which landed in a position where it was impossible to pick up and return in time. Shouting a warning to his comrades, this gallant warrant officer threw himself on the grenade, which exploded, killing him instantly. His self-sacrifice undoubtedly saved the lives of many others. Company Sergeant Major Osborne was an inspiring example to all throughout the defence, which he asserted so magnificently in maintaining against an overwhelming enemy force for eight and a half hours. And in his death, he displayed the highest quality of heroism and self-sacrifice. John Osborne won the first Canadian Victoria Cross of the Second World War, and the only one for the Battle of Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, he is remembered on column 25 of the Sao Wan Memorial, as well as a marker on the spot where he was killed. And until the handover to China in 1997, the main military barracks on the island were named in his honour. A statue also stands in Hong Kong Park that bears his name. This was not originally a statue of him, but it's that of an anonymous First World War soldier, repurposed as a monument. In many ways, the most fitting tribute to him. In Canada, his medals consisting of the British War Medal and the Victory Medal for his time in the First World War, as well as those for the Second, the 1939-45 to Star, the Pacific Star, the Defence Medal, the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal with Hong Kong Bar, the War Medal, and of course, his Victoria Cross, are on display in the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. There is a plaque bearing his name and deeds at Curry Barracks in Calgary, and there are several units in all branches of the Canadian military named after him, as well as several streets and buildings. He was also the subject of a Heritage Minute, a series of short films telling moments in Canadian history made in 2005. A link can be found in the description to it. It isn't a particularly accurate retelling of events, but by all means, please watch it if you wish. As mentioned at the beginning, in Britain and Norfolk, he is a little-known figure, although his name does appear at the Bolmarsh War Memorial in Cambridgeshire, where his family was living at the time of his death. I am not saying that his actions should be claimed by Britain. They were carried out in a Canadian unit under Canadian command. I am just thinking he should be remembered for his bravery on both sides of the Atlantic. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Feel free to subscribe and like if you wish. This was John Osborne, VC. Born in Norfolk, died in Hong Kong remembered in Canada. And this was a little bit of history.